April 18, 1993. David Koresh is the most notorious religious leader in the United States. When Christ reveals himself, it's going to be according to the book. To his followers, he's a modern-day messiah. He gave me every reason to keep believing. Many feel he's been hand-picked by God. If he said the sky is green, they were going to believe it. I think David Koresh 100% believed that he was a prophet. But to the authorities, he's a dangerous criminal. This guy is a liar and a fraud, and he took sexual advantage of children. He said it was his duty to have 21 children by virgins. And soon, he will leave them and the rest of his flock to their very own Armageddon. We had no idea what we were in for. This is the last 24 hours in the life of David Koresh. Waco, Texas, April 18th, 1993, 12.30 p.m. David Koresh, the leader of a doomsday cult known as the Branch Davidians, is barricaded in a religious center 100 miles south of Dallas. He's been seriously wounded in a shootout with law enforcement, and in just 24 hours, he'll be dead. Outside, more than 700 armed federal agents have surrounded the area. You saw multiple law enforcement agencies, emergency equipment, uh, federal agencies, buses, uh, SWAT teams, civilians. It had every element of humanity and law enforcement that you could possibly see. Koresh and 83 of his most loyal followers, including 21 children, have been holed up here at their Mount Carmel compound for the last 50 days. We expected that one by one we'd eventually all come out. We were kind of waiting on God through, you know, to convey through David as to what we were to do. I was very encouraged to continue on because um, he gave me every reason to keep believing. Employing more than 40 negotiators, the FBI work around the clock to persuade Koresh and his followers to surrender. Leading those negotiations is Byron Sage. David was a master of deception and a master of delay. I guess he felt the longer he delayed, the more exposure he had on the world stage. I mean, think about it. By this time, he had been on the front page of nearly every news magazine in the United States. And for the FBI, the intense media scrutiny only adds to the pressure. The average amount of time of a hostage barricade situation in the United States is about six to eight hours. Hours. The whole thing was just totally unprecedented. Authorities view Koresh as a glorified con man who's brainwashed his followers. One of those who followed him was Dana Okamoto. He was really good at talking around things and using semantics to get you off track and into where he wanted to go. Negotiating with the Davidians is not like negotiating with the local dope dealer or cop killer because David and the other people in charge want to talk about the Bible. And the FBI is not trained to talk about the Bible. David Koresh believes that this standoff with authorities was prophesied long ago in the Bible. David's predecessors, and David too, believed that the army of Babylon, believed to be an army of unbelievers, would attack them. Now, the so-called Army of Babylon prepares to break the stalemate and, according to Koresh, is about to set off an apocalyptic prophecy. A prophecy that David Koresh has been preaching for the last eight years as the leader of the Branch Davidian cult. An offshoot of the Seventh-day Adventists, 
the Davidian's whole belief system centers on the literal interpretation of the Book of Revelation. And no one could interpret the Word of God quite like Koresh. He understood what to tell us, how to explain it to us. Um, we felt very close to God when David was teaching us. The way we've been brought up, the way we've been taught for years, was that if somebody had a message from God, that kind of made them a prophet. The group that was around David would believe anything he said. If he said the sky is green, they were going to believe it. Using the Bible, Koresh rationalized the use of force to defend the faith. And he quite often cited the scripture in which Jesus tells his followers on the eve of his own arrest, sell your cloak and buy a sword, which in today's terminology would be, be buy an M16 or an AK-47. David Koresh's interest in weapons would eventually lead to his downfall. David Koresh and the people at Mount Carmel began to attract the attention of the ATF when a shipment of grenades they had ordered, hollowed out grenades, meaning inert grenades, when a shipment of these broke open and a UPS delivery man saw them, he called the local authorities. Given the group's radical beliefs, the ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, placed Mount Carmel under surveillance. And on February 28, 1993, they organized a secret raid on the compound to arrest Koresh. But he was informed by a follower that the authorities were on their way. Clive Doyle was at Koresh's side. He'd heard somebody was coming. Just what to expect, I don't know what he was expecting, but he, he went to the front door. A master manipulator, Koresh believed he could talk his way out of the jam. Former Davidian David Thibodeau remembers the cult leader's words. He says, now everyone, they're coming, they're on their way. Don't anyone do anything stupid. I want to talk to them. I'm going to try to work this out. It's a matter of dispute as to who fired the first shot. And then just all hell broke loose. And it just seemed at that point that shots were coming from all around the building. With 21 children inside, one of the Davidians made a desperate 911 call. 911, what's your emergency? Um, there's children and women in here to call it off. But for more than two hours, both sides continued shooting. Four ATF agents and six Branch Davidians were killed. More than 20 other agents were wounded before a ceasefire was finally negotiated. For authorities, the raid was a full-blown disaster. What the ATF did not understand was that the people at Mount Carmel, when they looked out their windows, said, oh, here is the army of Babylon come to destroy our faith. We must defend our faith. I remember being amazed at how many people had come to take us down, if you will. I saw a couple of their faces, and they actually looked just stunned that they were walking away from the situation. With federal agents murdered by the Davidians, the FBI took charge. In the skirmish, David Koresh was seriously wounded, shot in the hip and wrist. I think he thought he was going to die. Koresh called his mother, got a recording. Mother, they shot me and I'm dying, all right? But I'll be back real soon, OK? And I'll, I'll see you all in the skies. Bye. His mother, Bonnie Holderman, later tried to call him back. Of course, I picked the phone up and started trying to call back, and I couldn't get anybody. So I guess it wasn't meant to be for me to talk to him. And she never would again. And now, 50 days later, the botched ATF raid has not only left Koresh dangerously wounded, but also led to the longest siege in modern American history. A siege that will soon end in catastrophe.
Waco, Texas, April 19th, 1993. It's 2 a.m. and David Koresh has less than 11 hours left to live. For the past 50 days, Koresh's cult, the Branch Davidians, have been locked in a bitter standoff with authorities who are preparing to finally force him from his sanctuary. However, Koresh has no intention of giving up just yet. Despite being wounded in an earlier firefight, he's writing his interpretation of one of the Bible's most contested passages in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation says that only the lamb, who is a holy figure, can unlock the seven seals. Koresh's claim to fame was that he was the lamb and he and only he could explain those passages that refer to the seven seals. One of the lead FBI negotiators is Clint Van Zandt. The great carrot that David Koresh held out to the FBI and federal government was that when I finish my interpretation of the seven seals, and I'm into it, when I finish this interpretation, then we're all going to come out. His interpretation was that it was a big build up to the final days and how God would reveal himself to the world and his kingdom would be set up on the earth and that the group of people he was talking to, us, we were the people who would help deliver that message to the world. But the FBI are not interested in debating religious prophecies. Throughout the siege, the FBI have employed extreme psychological tactics in an attempt to flush out David Koresh and his followers. Agents have cut off the electricity and bombard the compound with sound. The FBI officials had some Tibetan chants on a tape that was being played over a loud speaker system, blasting it in to the Branch Davidian compound. And then they started playing the sounds of rabbits being slaughtered, Nancy Sinatra, these boots were made for walking. So they had sirens, they had jets, they had breaking glass and things, sounds that were being played in. And again, it was kind of psychological operations. It's like, let's keep them up, just like we're being kept up. Let's stress them out like we're being stressed out. So mutually, we'll come together and say, hey, we're all tired of this. But despite his wounds, Koresh remains defiant. He records a video message and sends it out to the FBI. And bringing these tanks and stuff around here, I tell you what, being an American first, I'm the kind of guy that I'll stand in front of a tank, you can run over me, but I'll be biting one of the tracks. No one's gonna hurt me or my family. So it was just basically a moral question. We had to, had to make a stand for what we believed. <laughs> David Koresh believes that he has the right to oppose the forces surrounding him. But he has no idea that in a few hours, the FBI are planning to hit the compound with tear gas to drive him from Mount Carmel, his home for the last nine years. Koresh's first home was in Houston, Texas, where, back on August 17th, 1959, he was born Vernon Wayne Howell to Bonnie Sue Clark, a teenaged high school student. I uh, was very much in love with David's father, but my daddy wouldn't allow us to get married. He was 19, I was 15. Bonnie's boyfriend barely got a chance to meet his tiny newborn son. And soon enough, the teenage romance was over. He saw him a couple of times, two or three times, and then after he was four, Vernon was four, I moved away to the Dallas area from Houston. Desperate for stability, she jumped into a marriage with another man who began to take his violent temper out on the young boy. There was a couple of times that he whipped him sort of hard, left bruises on, the, on his behind. It was about two years we were together. It didn't work out. Now out of options, 18-year-old Bonnie dropped off her son at his grandparents and promptly left town to find work. I don't know what I'd done without my mother. She was a big help to me because I was searching for myself. Young David was five before he lived with his mother again. By then, Bonnie had remarried 
and the boy was faced with yet another father figure. And if home life had been a trial for David, so was school. They started evaluating David because he was having problems with certain areas in school, even though he had a high IQ and was very smart. So they sent him to a special classes. Plagued with learning difficulties, the young boy soon earned the nickname Mr. Retardo. I said, well, you know you're not retarded, so just don't pay any attention to him. A failure at school, David found comfort in music and fell in love with the guitar. David wanted to be a rock star. That was his goal. And uh, he sure could play loud enough to be a rock star. <laughs> Next, young David discovered the Holy Bible. Like the rest of his family, he'd been raised in the ways of the Seventh-day Adventist church, whose members believe in the second coming of Christ. He really took an interest in learning the scriptures and taking them to heart and studying and wanting to know why, why things happened and why God did this and that. And he was really interested, and especially in, in the, the Old Testament. What appealed most to David was the power of the Bible. When he prayed, he began to believe that God was actually speaking directly to him. David soon discovered evangelical preachers who also claimed God was speaking to them. And I had bought him a nice big radio, and he would listen to the um, radio preachers. Armed with the mighty word of God, the preacher was a powerful figure. He could wield strong influence on his followers, which was appealing to a young and impressionable David Koresh. And now, some 20 years later, as he struggles to complete his manuscript in the besieged compound, the leader of the Branch Davidians is about to lead his adoring flock into infamy. Waco, Texas, April 19th, 1993, 5.59 a.m. In the Mount Carmel Center, a wounded David Koresh is slowly waking up. He has less than seven hours left to live. Outside the compound after 51 days, fed up with Koresh's stalling tactics, government agents decide to move things along by unleashing a tear gas attack. FBI head negotiator Byron Sage informs the Davidians of their plan and I put the call in about 6 o'clock in the morning, warning them that we were prepared to introduce tear gas. They started to play on the, the speaker systems that the siege is over, that we're going to be inserting tear gas into the building, and um, you're all under arrest. Come on out with your hands up. And they just kept saying that over and over. The tear gas plan was actually two plans. At the low end of potential violence, is the introduction of CS tear gas. That was plan A. But if they opened fire on us with deadly force, then we would go immediately to plan B. And plan B was to saturate that compound, every room, as rapidly as we could. But with 21 young children locked inside, using tear gas is a dangerous proposition. And I remember going to bed the night before, knowing that that next morning gas was going to be inserted. I didn't sleep that night. Just after 6 a.m., the gassing begins. It's put in through this long probe-type device on the front of this tank retriever, as well as it was fired in in canisters. The Davidians have a supply of gas masks. And we're getting my gas mask, putting it on, feeling rather scared at that time. I remember hearing the sound of breaking glass and the popping sounds all over, like around the building. And you'd hear the gas spray somewhere. But gas masks are not made for children. They will be the most vulnerable during the attack. We banked on the fact that the parents through a natural parental instinct, 
once that tear gas started to be inserted into that location, would move heaven and earth to get their kids out of there. I would, but we were wrong. Although bedridden for much of the siege as a result of his gunshot wound, on this day, Koresh is up and about, organizing the defense of Mount Carmel. David Koresh ordered the women and children to take shelter in the concrete room, which was a walk-in cooler, and was called the bunker by the FBI. That was the safest place in the building. For Koresh, the children are the cult's most precious possession. Twelve are his, fathered with his various wives. Like his own parents, Koresh had his first child when he was just a teenager, long before getting involved with the Davidian cult. When David was around 19, he met his first love. Her name was Linda. She was around, I think, 14 or 15. Beautiful, beautiful, blonde-headed girl. I didn't realize that they were actually having sex together, but anyway, she comes up pregnant. Her dad refused to let David see her anymore. Losing Linda had a very big impact on David's life because I know he loved her very well. Cut off from Linda and his child, the 20-year-old was suddenly adrift looking for his place in the world. In 1981, he washed up on the doorstep of Mount Carmel and the Living Waters branch of the Seventh-day Adventists. The Davidian sect has existed since the 30s as a breakaway group from the Seventh-day Adventist church. And the Davidians have long believed when Jesus will return, the world will be destroyed. I look at the Branch Davidians as a whole separate country. They speak a whole separate language. They have a whole different belief system from what mainstream America has. There was nothing about David, either at his first visit or subsequent visits, that indicated he was anything special. He was just, you might say, a new convert. But Koresh caught the eye of the then leader of the Davidians, 67-year-old Lois Roden. And she was so impressed with the young man's interpretation of the Bible that she took him under her wing. One morning, she got up and says David Koresh had been coming and, and studying with her at night in her house and uh, had been showing her things. And she urged the others to start listening to him because she thought he had a unique message or new light to bring onto the scriptures they were studying. Revelation of John the Apostle. Soon others began to see Koresh in a new way. Hailed as a prophet, he seemed to have a gift when it came to interpreting the word of God. My first thought when he walked in the door was, so, the prophet of God is a hippie. <laughs> the whole package was, oh my God. <laughs> and that was my first impression of the prophet of God. But uh, he, once he sat down and started to speak, everything changed for me because I felt the presence of God in the room. He could recite whole passages, paragraphs and paragraphs from the Bible without looking at any source. David Krish made a whole lot more sense than other people. Um, and I was very impressed by what, what he was able to put together and explain in the Bible. He had gotten the group to the point where he didn't have to speak from the Bible anymore. He could just speak as if from God. God's lips to your ears. What man thought possible? But Koresh's work didn't end at the pulpit. He was soon sharing the bed of the center's matriarch, Lois Roden. Which was quite shocking to most people, if only because of the better than 20 year difference in their ages. Koresh moved to the other extreme when he next married 14-year-old Rachel Jones, daughter of a highly influential Davidian family. 
if you believe God's condoning it or, or ordering it, you, you tend to accept it. His marriage also strengthened his position as the cult's leader in waiting. But Lois Roden's son, George, also had his eyes on the leadership prize. George was very upset because George saw himself as the heir apparent to the group because he was Lois Roden's son. So he felt he should be the leader. Against the Lord and against his anointed. In 1984, three years after David arrived at Mount Carmel, the power struggle between David Koresh and George Roden finally came to a head. And Koresh and his sympathizers were kicked out of Mount Carmel. George Roden was a menacing person, and David took his followers out of Mount Carmel because he wanted to avoid fireworks. After finally finding his purpose and his voice, David Koresh was being silenced. But now, nine years later, as the standoff with the FBI comes to a head, David Koresh prepares to make his final statement, one that will be heard around the world. April 19th, 1993, 9 a.m. For the last 51 days, holed up in his Waco, Texas compound, wounded Branch Davidian leader David Koresh has refused to surrender to authorities. And now he and his followers, including 21 children, are being tear gassed by the FBI. David Koresh has less than four hours to live. In a crowded hallway, Koresh reassures the Davidians and gives his final orders to a select few. For Koresh, the prophecy of the end times has finally arrived, and he's determined to make his final stand. School teacher and fellow Davidian Graham Craddock gets a moment with his spiritual leader. He was sitting on the floor. I went up to him and I saw a box of grenades by, by his side. He looked at me and he said, do you know how to use one of these? Koresh hands him a homemade grenade. He didn't tell me what to use it for. I didn't really want to take it, mainly because if I put it in my pocket, go off my pocket, I'd end up half maimed. For the last three hours, gas attacks orchestrated by the FBI have failed to flush Koresh or his followers out of their sanctuary. But things are about to get much worse. And the Branch Davidians began firing their weapons out at the FBI armored vehicle. The tactical team took that as their cue then to advance the clock, to let's put a lot of gas in and let's really drive them out of there. As the FBI escalates the gas attack, tanks smash their way further into the building. I watched the tank take the two front doors and push them back into the building to where I was, so I had to back up more into the chapel area. I'll never forget what it's like to see a tank coming through the front door of the place that you live. It's, uh, it's devastating. As the armored vehicles maneuver around the compound, they inadvertently sever Koresh's phone line with the FBI. He is no longer able to communicate with his attackers. David came down to the chapel area and said, you know, they severed the phone cord, so right now there's no negotiation. Um, we're just going to show them that we're not going to come out, and hopefully they'll get us another phone line. With the phone line cut, the FBI continues to deliver their message over loudspeakers. Tanks penetrate deep into the building, ripping the structure apart. With the situation growing ever more desperate, Koresh refuses to be driven from his sanctuary. But nine years earlier, in 1984, David Koresh had been thrown out of his precious Mount Carmel by George Roden, son of the then leader, Lois Roden. However, Koresh, determined to hold on to his ministry, took his followers to a pinewood forest 90 miles away in Palestine, Texas. 
He dropped me off all by myself out there with an ax and a tomahawk. It says, cut a road into the middle of the, it was like a pine forest and a lot of underbrush and stuff. He says, I'm going off to get some building supplies and I'll be back. He ended up coming back with some guys and a truckload of lumber and we built a communal building there that we could all meet in and eat in. When I arrived, there was the one log cabin in the center and then there were a bunch of buses that had been hollowed out and people were living in the buses. There was no plumbing, there was no electricity. I call it the Piney Woods. It's just one of the most picturesque places I've been. But back at Mount Carmel, which George Roden had renamed Rodenville, things were not going so well. His mother, the group's figurehead, passed away, and George was losing members to Koresh. And so Roden issued Koresh a bizarre challenge. In it, the two Davidian leaders would compete to raise a 20-year-old corpse from the dead. George Roden had dug up Anna Hughes and had her casket sitting above ground. And this came to Koresh's knowledge. And he and his followers said, hey, digging up corpses is illegal. Let's get George arrested. They went to the county sheriff who said, bring me proof that Anna Hughes has been dug up. Koresh and eight others set out to get photographic evidence of the corpse and of Roden's crime. Knowing that the leader of Rodenville was prone to violence, they came armed. They went to shoot the photo and got in a gunfight with George Roden, in which no one was killed, but for which David was arrested. None of them were convicted, meaning none of them did time, because their argument was that it was self-defense. Within a year, George Roden himself ended up in jail on charges including murder. And Koresh seized the opportunity to reclaim Mount Carmel. Many shall see it and fear. Now the undisputed leader of Mount Carmel, Koresh celebrated his return by changing his name. When Vernon Howe took the name David Koresh, it was as if a person had taken a new name upon baptism. David styled his new persona from two biblical heroes, King David and Koresh, a legendary biblical leader. You take a new name to say, I am a changed person, I am different, my life will be different. As he developed his new identity at Mount Carmel, he turned to his love of music, well aware of its seductive powers. He said, you know, Mama, uh, music is how God is going to bring the kids in, you know, to learn. Music is where it's at. Things were going well for David Koresh. He was even able to capitalize on his love of music by integrating concerts into his Bible studies. What began happening over a course of time is that it was almost like a tradition where after dinner, they would call the band and we'd play for about an hour or so. They would start playing his music. Uh, it could be 9.30, 10 o'clock at night. And we knew that was the time to come down. People would start coming in and David would, would go off into a study that could last anywhere from just a couple of hours to eight or nine hours. In addition to their home at Mount Carmel, the Davidians had a residence in Laverne, California, that became an integral part of David's plan to promote his music career and recruit new members. After David became the top dog at Mount Carmel, the group bought a house in California, which was used when they were trying to make it in Hollywood and in the music scene. It was their base of operations for the musical ministry in its attempt to uh, Christianize the world through Hollywood. Koresh was now able to blend both of his childhood fantasies, preacher and rock star. But after 51 days under siege, David Koresh, the self-appointed Lamb of God, 
watches helplessly as his apocalyptic church falls to pieces. For Koresh and his followers, the end of the world is indeed coming. April 19th, 1993, 10.30 a.m. As the FBI continues to pound the Branch Davidians with tanks and tear gas, David Koresh's situation is growing ever more desperate. The building is starting to collapse around him. He has only two hours to live. The armored vehicles are now penetrating deep enough to reach the inner sanctuary. In the FBI camp, Agents listen in through electronic bugs, trying to get a picture of what David Koresh and his followers are doing inside the compound. But over the roar of the tank assault, it is difficult to hear anything. The ceiling of the vault begins to give way on the women and children inside. In the chaos, Graham Craddock thinks he sees another follower pouring fuel. And there was a guy, he looked like he was pouring something out of his can, out of a fuel can onto the floor. I heard this scream out from one of the other guys, wait, wait, not inside, do it outside. A few minutes later, I heard a call from upstairs saying the building's on fire. To authorities, it's clear the blaze has been started deliberately by the Davidians. There is no doubt in my mind that the Branch Davidians struck the individual matches that set that compound on fire. But the Davidians tell a different story. I never believed that any of the Davidians started the fire. I mean, I never saw anyone pouring any kind of accelerant or anything like that. I don't think that they killed themselves. And be the reason I say this is because the women and children were supposed to live on, particularly the children. There was nothing in the message about the children being killed for any reason. With Mount Carmel in flames, Koresh and the Davidians either have to flee or be burned alive. Throughout the siege, by way of FBI negotiations, some Davidians have been allowed to leave the compound. One of those is Sheila Martin, who watches on with horror while the rest of her family is still trapped inside. My thought was, where is everyone? And I could see places on the building where there was no flames, no smoke. I kept hearing that's where they were. The wall to my right caught fire when it didn't singe the side of my face, and I could hear some hair crackling. The worst fears of the FBI are being realized. As soon as we saw the smoke, my instructions became a request. And as that fire built, the request became a plea. David, don't do this. And the roar of the fire once it started cooking off, I mean, it was loud. It was like a train coming down the track at you. But so strong is Koresh's hold on his flock that his followers are fearful of leaving. A few years earlier, Koresh was able to tighten his grip on his followers by bringing in tough and controversial new edicts. People have asked me what it was all about for David. Was it money? Was it love? Was it power? I believe it was power. It was about a man who wanted a group of people to obey him. At Mount Carmel, David had strict rules regarding discipline. When children misbehaved, they were paddled with a little wooden stick. David used it sometimes himself. When adults misbehave, they were scolded or denied certain privileges. I have memories that I, I'm not proud of. I actually started disciplining my older son closer to six months. And I remember spanking him once and looking at the paddle, and it had his blood on it. And if there is one thing I regret, it's that moment. Most drastic of all was Koresh's new vision for himself. He basically taught that he was a Christ, but 
with our afflictions, with our, with our weaknesses. Whereas Jesus had lived free of sin, Koresh, as the new prophet, embraced sin. He referred to himself as the sinful Messiah. In what he called the new light, Koresh taught that as the one closest to God, he was the only one worthy of fathering children. The men and women who were married at Mount Carmel or who thought of themselves as husband and wife were no longer husband and wife. Everyone was married to Christ, whose word or spokesman was David Koresh. Under the revelation of the new light, men were expected to practice celibacy, and even masturbation was outlawed. While for Koresh, who had a taste for young girls, followers as young as 14 were his for the taking. And the fact that it might be illegal in certain states or in this country or whatever was not an issue if he figured he was being obedient to God. It sounds insane. It would be insane to most people where um, Koresh has babies, as many babies as possible for the kingdom of God, and he gets all the, uh, the, the women. I realized I was being called to do something for God, and that if I did this, I could, I could open my Bible and see it right there and go, this is what I'm doing. This is my part in the story. Koresh had finally gained the power he had lacked as a bullied child. Mr. Retardo was now running the show. Who is worthy to open this book and to lose the seals thereof? But with the continuing growth of his cult came the expense of running it. David had to support about 120 people who cost him about $150 a month. He had to have an income. This was when Koresh turned to trading guns. They would sell guns and other things. I remember they bought an army disposal store that was going out of business. They bought everything they had. There was meals ready to eat. There was, you know, military uniforms and boots, and they bought the whole stock. The legal semi-automatics that Koresh and his people bought doubled in value during the years that Koresh was leading Mount Carmel. Koresh's money-making venture was alarming to federal agents. The thing that I think gave all of us pause was the fact that the entire focus of the Branch Davidian faith was centered on the concept of a, a major battle, the end of the world, the Battle of Armageddon, uh, and the end times. And now, for David Koresh and his followers, the end of the world is almost here. April 19th, 1993, 12.20 p.m. After a 51-day siege in Waco, Texas, the Branch Davidian compound is a blazing inferno. Over their PA system, the FBI pleads with Koresh and the others to come out. As the building burns to the ground, those still alive have run out of options. I said, well, I'd rather be shot than burned to death. And I really had the feeling, upon exiting the building, that I was going to be shot. And I kind of stumbled over all of this two-by-fours and sheetrock and come out the hole. I remember when I came out, my, my jacket was all melting and uh, Skin was just rolling off my hand. In all, only nine Davidians make it out alive. Reaching the survivors, FBI agents drill them about the location of the cult's children. And he's screaming at me, where are the kids, where are the kids? I said, I don't know. I said, I haven't seen any of the kids. None of the nine survivors are children and there's no sign of Koresh. My greatest fear was that he would have a secret David Koresh tunnel and that the building would be hot, it would take a day or two to cool off, and then after three days, David Koresh would pop up out of a spider hole. Three days, Christ has been resurrected, and that every religious wacko nut in the world 
would make their way to Waco, the new Mecca, and would be there to worship David Koresh, the risen savior. But for the self-appointed savior, his time on earth has run out. Three days later, forensic investigators discover 33-year-old David Koresh's body in the charred ruins. In his forehead, they find a single gunshot wound. The autopsy suggests that David Koresh was killed at close range. Either he pulled the trigger or he was shot by one of his followers. I think he was a manipulative, functional, psychotic, a sociopath. I think he took terrible advantage of the Branch Davidians. I think those people died because of his failed leadership. In all, 74 people die at Mount Carmel. 21 of those are children, all under the age of 12. Three quarters of those are David Koresh's own children. Despite the carnage, some still keep faith in their Texan messiah. I believe David will be resurrected. And I'm going to see my grandchildren again. I believe that, in a sense, God was willing to sacrifice this group of people for a greater cause. But others see Koresh in a different light. David's biggest failure was the fact that the kids were not released during the siege at some point. That's the unforgivable thing, is that these kids never had a chance. The FBI was also left to account for its own failures. It had tragically misread the cult and made a series of disastrous tactical mistakes. We grossly underestimated the extent of control that David Koresh held over all of those people. I think the federal government failed. I think Koresh's master plan was carried out by David Koresh. And I think we, FBI, ATF, other agencies, I think we facilitated that master plan. We didn't nail him on the cross. We burned him to the ground. <laughs> 